Um, and if you could keep your microphones on mute throughout the session, please. Um, and if you have any questions or anything at all, just pop your hand up or pop it in the chat and Beth and myself will keep an eye out for this. Um, so over to you, Beth. Thank you. Beth, thank you. So hi everyone, I'm Beth um, and I am the Finance Transactions Manager at Lancashire Teaching Hospitals. So um, before being the Finance Transactions Manager, oh sorry, I think we've got some back noise. Sorry, would you just mind putting yourselves on mute? Thank you. Um, so yeah, before being the Finance Transactions Manager, I was a Deputy Financial Advisor and a Senior Assistant Financial Advisor in Financial Advice, um, and I worked on budget setting for my trust. So despite the fact that I have now moved over to financial services, I have sort of spent four years doing this before I moved into my new role. So um, yeah, so we're just going to have a look at understanding budgets, how we get there, and um, the kind of input we need from you guys as clinicians or non-finance staff. Um, and then spreadsheets and how they can be used to um, help present data in a better format that's more understandable um, because we know that when we talk finance it's like talking in a different language and um, so I apologize that you can kind of see the side of my head and um, I've got my presentation on one screen and you guys on another and I would much prefer to talk to you guys when I speak and um, so if you've got like Megan said if you've got any questions um, just pop them in the chat, I've got the chat open, or just unmute and pop your hand up and just speak out if that's quicker. Um, I know sometimes that by the time someone says, have you got any questions and you've finished typing, we've already moved on. Um, so yeah, um, we will get started. Come on, there we go. So in the session, we're going to look at understanding the principles of setting budgets and um, understanding your role as a budget holder, knowing how to effectively manage a budget and also demystifying finance. So doing some jargon busting. Like I said, I know that we kind of speak in a different language and um, we need to make sure that, you know, we're making we're, we're speaking to you in, in a way that you understand. And when we talk to you about finance, you know, I'm sure that if someone came to me and started talking about heart surgery, I wouldn't know what they were talking about. So we'll just play a quick game first. Um, so if you want to put your answers in the chat, you can just answer with letters. So accrual, does anybody know which of these um, descriptions describes an accrual? So we've got an amount that you put aside in your accounts to cover a future liability, cost or income recorded in the account, but has not yet been invoiced in the period they relate to, amounts paid for in advance of the goods or services being received at the period or year end, or financial debt or obligations that arise during the course of business operations. So if you want to put which letter you think describes an accrual. Okay, we've got some coming in. We've got Bs, lots of Bs. We've got a couple of Ds. C. Oh, we've got a good mix. Okay, so the correct answer is B. So an accrual is where we would enter um, an adjustment into the ledger, into your cost centre for um, any costs, so charges or any income um, that we haven't been invoiced for or we haven't invoiced. So there's an example here, we've got an electricity bill and we're billed every quarter, every three months. However, when we're billed in March, for example, that will relate to January, February and March. So what finance would do is we would put an accrual in in January for £100, accrual in in February for £200, and then we would release our accrual and in March we would get an invoice for the full £300 which we would pay. So we're basically just making sure that you don't just get one invoice every three months but that actually you get an equal charge every month and we would do that for any kind of material charges and that would depend on what your finance materiality limit was and you can ask them about that and um, so it's always good that if you know for example you've just signed up to a contract and they're not going to bill you until the end of the year it's always good to let your finance department know and um, because they can accrue for it during the year so that when you get your invoice it's not a big surprise or a big hit um, to your financial position and it basically reserves the money in the budget so you say well I've committed to spend £12,000 on a contract and every month they would accrue £1,000 and then when it comes in, you've practically already paid for £11,000 of it. So it's just a technical adjustment that means that we pay for things when we've 
when we've used them as such um, rather than when we get the invoice. So the next one is prepayment and the descriptions are the same. Um, so we can kind of maybe go by a bit of process of elimination, um, but let me know what you think. We don't, we've got lots coming in. Okie doke. So we've had all C's so far and C is correct. So a prepayment is when is the other way around. So that's when we um, pay in advance for a contract, for example. So we've got um, 12 month contract such as insurance and we pay it in January, but it relates to January to December. So technically we in January we have paid for the entire year, but in January you've only used January's element of the contract. So what happens is we prepay whatever relates to future periods and each month we drop the value in. So we would drop in one twelfth or if it was a 12 year contract or a three year contract, we just enter whichever element relates to that month. So it's the opposite of an accrual. So rather than us accruing for a charge, we're taking out money that you shouldn't yet have spent because, for example, that £1,200 is £100 a month charge. So we don't need to pay it all in January, we would split it. So that's the opposite of an accrual. So then we've got provision. So we've got an amount that you put aside in your accounts to cover a future liability. Money held in the balance sheet can be carried over financial years and made available when required with or without restrictions on use. Then we've got C, a resource with value that a company owns or controls with the expectation that it will provide future benefits. And then D, money that is set aside to buy or improve the buildings equipment that it uses to produce products or provide services. So does anybody know what a provision is? OK, so we've got D's and A's. We've got any other ones? No. Nope. A. So um, a provision is, is somebody that we put aside in the accounts to cover a future liability. So, for example, um, if, if we have bad debt, so a debt that we know is not going to be paid, sometimes organisations provide for that. So it's called a bad, debt, a bad debt provision. So basically what we say is, hmm, we're not sure that we're going to get paid this money. So we're actually going to give ourselves the hit for it now and we're going to provide for it and say we're going to put some money aside. And if we don't get paid that debt, this money is going to cover it. So that's what a provision is for. It may be for, like I say, bad debts. It could be for, um, if, for example, if there's, a, if there's a legal case going on and you think that you might have to pay out some money, it could be for anything like that. So it's for something that's going to be a future liability and we just put the money on the balance sheet and we say it's just there just in case we need it. If then, for example, the debt got paid, we could reduce the provision and say, well, the debt was £100,000, but actually £20,000 of that came in. So we no longer need £20,000 of that provision because um, we got it when we didn't expect to. Um, and you can reduce or increase the provision as you see fit. Then we've got reserves. So we've got money held in the balance sheet can be carried over financial years and made available when required with or without restrictions on use. The reduction in the value of an asset over time, so due in particular to wear and tear, an expense reported on the income statement, but there is no cash payment. Then we've got a resource with value that a company owns, which was on the last one. And then again, D, money that is set aside to buy or improve the buildings or the equipment. So let's have a look what we've got coming in. Okay, so in A's and D's. A. So reserves is money that we hold on the balance sheet and um, there is usually a reserves manager who determines what we can and can't spend it on. So um, you may not always have reserves. It depends on your budget setting um, or your income generation and that kind of thing. Um, but it could be used for many different things like it says there, purchasing fixed assets 
for funding expansion. So, for example, if you take a business case, you might get told that it will be funded from reserves um, and it's just an amount of money that we put aside and you can carry over financial years um, and you kind of use it in, in an as and when situation. Um, and sometimes they can have certain um, rules around what you can use it for. And sometimes it can just be that you say, I need money from reserves. But I can see we've got a hand up. Hi Beth, can I just um, ask, um, I clicked on D because I think that little line about with or without restrictions, um, it made me swerve towards a different answer. Um, so can reserves be something that have no restrictions then? Yes, yeah, so it's all dependent on your organisation. So some organisations say it can only be used for business cases like expansions. Some people say it can only be used for um, like liabilities that we don't know about. So like a provision is a liability that you know about, so you know it's going to come like a bad debt. And um, but some may say it's like emergency funds. And um, so some organisations might put restrictions on, but some organisations don't and they just say it's there for whatever we see fit. So you can speak to your finance department about kind of what, what whether they have restrictions on their reserves or not, or if you even have any. Some organisations don't have them. And um, I hope that answers your question. Okay, so then we've got journal. So we've got an amount that you put in aside in your accounts to cover a future liability, the process of moving budget from one place to another, an end to end inventory management system or the process of moving actual costs from one place to another. OK, this is interesting. So a lot of people have said C, um, but it's not C. So, so you might hear your finance staff say to you, oh, I'll journal it or let me know what it is and I'll do a journal. Um, and basically it's when we move costs from one place to another. So say, for example, you order pens and paper and when you're coding it on the ledger um, or when you've raised the purchase order, you've coded it to um, course fees by accident. So once it's been coded and it's been approved, there's no way that you can amend the code. And um, however, what we would do is we would do a journal in finance and we would change the code. So basically what we do is we move it from one subjective code, course fees, and put it into stationary. So that's how finance would make adjustments in the ledger. They do journals and um, you can do, you can actually do budget journals. So anybody who put B, that would have been correct as well. Moving budget from one place to another. And um, in my organization, we call them environments, but you can call them budget journals. They're the same. So it's whenever you need to make an amendment to a code. So you need to either move costs or budget. And um, either of those would have been correct. And that's what we do. We do a journal and it's basically just that's how we also do an accrual. So whenever we do an accrual in the ledger, we do it via a journal. Oh, Jackie, you call them environments too. Oh, that's the first organisation I think I've ever come across that calls them environments because if you type that, if you type that word into like a word document, for example, it's not actually a real word. So I don't know where our organisations get that word from. Um, but yeah, so we call them environments, but some organisations call them budget journals. So we would a B or D would have been fine for that. Okie dokie. So moving on to setting budgets. So there are a few different budget setting methodologies and I'll go through kind of the main ones, but it will vary per organisation as to what you use. So there's historical budget setting, incremental budget setting, zero based budget setting and activity based or forecast out term budget setting. So each of these budget settings is a different method um, and we'll go through the pros and cons of them. Um, and you can go to your finance department and ask at any time um, what kind of budget setting method you use. Um, and actually it might change um, depending on the circumstances. Um, for example, like sometimes during COVID, um, organisations change the way they budget set based on the amount of money they were going to get from NHS England, etc. Um, so having a look at historical budget setting. So this is basically just a rollover of last year's budget. So you're not making any change and everything's assumed to be equal. So whatever your budget was last year, you've got exactly the same this year. It's just rolling over exactly the same. So it's got some pros and cons. So it's really simple. Um, that's a big pro. It's so simplistic because you do it once and then it's exactly the same every other year. So it's no work um, and that works great in like static industries. So it's really not a great way to, thing to use in the NHS because our, our 
income is changing all the time. The number of patients we see, the number of surgeries we do, the way we generate our income varies that much that it wouldn't probably be a very good method to use in the NHS. Some organisations do use it, um, not usually trusts, um, but some other NHS organisations who like don't have direct patient care, for example, they might use it. Um, and if your level of demand is really predictable and nothing really changes very much, it's a great one to use because if you do the same amount of work every year, you don't really need to change your budget because the amount of money you need to spend is exactly the same. The cons are that it doesn't account for levels of variability. So like I say, it doesn't account for the fact that we might have a really bad winter and actually it might cost us more. Um, and it includes one off items. So say, for example, within the year you say, I know my piece of equipment is unsafe to use and it will need um, replacing and I need £50,000 to do it. They'll give you £50,000 in budget setting. But if you roll over your budget the year after, you're going to get that £50,000 again because you're not making any changes. So that £50,000 isn't necessary because you won't need to replace the piece of equipment every year. So it doesn't account for that. It, it includes one off items, um, which, like I say, is, is no good because sometimes those things happen once in 10 years or once in five years and you're giving, you're giving excess money that's not needed. So there's some cons of using that method. Then we've got incremental budget setting. So this is a little bit different to historic. So it's last year's budget plus specific changes. So things like um, if you've had any savings to so cost improvement, if you've had any business cases or developments, um, if you've got any inflation or anything like that, which you'll have. So basically it's rolling over, but then amending for things that have changed. So this again has got pros and cons. So it's really time efficient because the only thing you're actually looking at is the changes. So say, for example, you've had five business cases that have been approved and that means that you've got, let's go to the extreme, you've got five new wards. So all you're doing is amending the budget to include the new five wards, the amount of staff that you need for them and the amount of income it's going to generate for the patients it's going to treat. So other than that, everything stays exactly the same. Um, it's really easy to understand and it's easy to articulate it. So basically you're only explaining to someone the changes that they'll already know about. So for a department who's had an expansion funded via a business case, they'll know that they've had an expansion funded via a business case because they'll have done the business case. So it's really easy to explain the changes in the budget because it's nothing that the, the department wouldn't be aware of. So it's really easy to explain where the numbers have come from. The difficulties with it are that it's reliant on the accuracy of the previous year's budget. So if you found last year that you were massively overspent because you didn't have enough money, you're only going to get money for new things. So it doesn't fix that problem. It doesn't fix the fact that last year the budget was incorrect because you're not changing anything that happened last year. You just you're just accommodating new things. So it's reliant on the previous year's budget being accurate. So if it's not, then you're just carrying forward the same problems. Um, and again, it, it will include any budgeted one off items that happened in the previous year. So again, like with the piece of equipment, if you got £50,000 given to you in a budget last year for a piece of equipment, you'll get it again this year because we're not, that's not something new that's happened. So it wouldn't be something that will be involved in the change. Are there any questions on historical or incremental? Because they're kind of quite similar. I'm going to presume no. Um, so I'll move on. So the next one is zero based budget setting. So this is basically a bottom up approach and it needs and it includes calculation. So um, you're starting from a blank page completely from scratch. And again, pros and cons. So it's really comprehensive. It includes it involves sitting down with your budget holders and literally saying, tell me what you need to provide a service. Um, all your income, all your expenditure is considered and it increases your accountability because, for example, if I as a finance person go to a meeting with my budget holder and my budget holder says to me, I need 20 nurses, I need X amount of this, X amount of that, and then the budget is given to them for that and they come back and say, oh, actually, it's incorrect. Our budget is based on what you have advised us as clinicians. So it increases that accountability within the trust or within the organisation that actually we've based the budget on what you've advised us. So if that then happens to be wrong, what you advised us was incorrect. So it's more working with clinicians to kind of find out what it is they need. Unfortunately, it's very timely. 
it, if to do zero based budget setting, you're looking at starting in October to get it done for April. It's so timely. Obviously, trusts vary in size and, um, you know, we have hundreds of departments um, and it involves our small finance team meeting with all of those departments, meeting with our matrons, with our clinical and seeing um, specialty business managers. So it is really timely um, and it's, it's dependent on the people who you're meeting with, considering what they need and giving the input and taking the time to really look at the service. So if you're absolutely rushed off your feet as a service and aren't going to have any time to be able to really, really consider what you need, the information that finance are going to get is not going to be comprehensive enough and, and it's going to cause problems. And also you've got risk of omission. So, you know, budget setting always goes down to the wire. But if you've got a department that just doesn't have time to see you, you you've no way of, of finding out what you need in finance to create that budget. So you've got risk of things being of going of being missing from the budget. And um, so it is very comprehensive, but it is really, really timely and takes a really long time to do. And it really needs input from everybody. It's really vital um, that everybody puts the puts the time in and, and considers everything. And finally, you've got activity based or forecast out term budget setting. So this is where the budget varies dependent on levels of activity. So this is usually outside of COVID, the budget setting method that my organisation uses. So basically, it's the most accurate because it's based on planned activity. So if you say I expect to see a thousand patients and it's going to cost me this much to see it to treat a thousand patients in my service, there should be you should, you should never have a problem. So it's really comprehensive and it's more than comprehensive than any of the other methods and um, because every element is calculated individually. So again, it still takes a lot of time and um, but the cons of it are it's reliant on achieving the income that you expect to achieve. So if you allow a budget for treating a thousand patients, if you then don't treat a thousand patients, you're not generating the correct amount of income. But actually, in some cases, your costs don't stop. So it's really vital that you'll have. I'm sure if anybody who uses this budget mess, budget setting method, you'll have your departments coming to you saying you're underachieving your income target. How are you restoring your income? You know, restoration at the minute is a big thing following COVID. And, you know, as we go into budget setting, there'll be there'll be conversations around how are we going to make sure, you know, given the situation that if we're doing something like activity based or forecast out term budget setting, how are we achieving that income target? And, you know, how are we making sure that if we fall behind, we're, we're bringing that income back up to date? And um, it also the forecast out term needs to be accurate. So usually when we do budget setting in this method in my organisation, we start in December. So we take month nine's position and we forecast it forward for the remainder of the year. So we say if we've spent nine thousand pound on bed linen in nine months, we're, we're thinking that's about a thousand pound a month. So we say we're probably going to spend twelve thousand pound a year. And that's what we do. We basically forecast it forward. But if you've got things in there that aren't correct, so accidentally somebody coded my drugs to my bed linen, that nine thousand pound is overstated or actually somebody coded the bed linen to the drugs code, your £9,000 is understated. So it's really important that the forecast out turn is accurate and that the period that you're using, the spend in that period is accurate because then obviously you're starting with wrong figures. So you're already kind of setting off on the wrong foot, which is why when you use this kind of budget setting method, your finance team really need to be on it and need to be making sure that they're reviewing your financial position each month, which everybody does, but in, in quite a lot of detail because something that seems like you know ten thousand pound a month might not actually seem that sufficient in in the grand scheme of millions of pounds but when you've got ten thousand pound a month by 12 months you then you're at 120 grand and that's when it starts adding up so you have to make sure your one-offs are excluded and that kind of thing so again going back to the machine purchase if oncology purchased a piece of equipment for a hundred thousand pound but that's only purchased once every 10 years when you do your forecast out turn, you don't want to include that hundred thousand pound piece of equipment because it's not something you expect to spend next year. So it needs a lot of detail and a lot of refining. Does anybody have any questions on budget setting methods in general or any questions about how to kind of go about it or your involvement or anything like that? No, okay, okay. 
So next we'll look at efficiency schemes. So when you're setting budgets um, in your organisation, I'm sure people call it multiple different things, um, but I'm sure all the time finance are hopping on about cost improvements or efficiency schemes or cost saving initiatives or whatever you might call it. Um, so this is a big part of budget setting and whenever an organisation sets a budget, they consider the savings they need to make. So at the minute for trusts, um, savings are determined by the ICS. So an ICS is given a savings target and that is then split across the organisations which it involves. Um, it might be different for CCGs, um, but everybody needs to make savings. And the best way to do this is by you know looking at processes and where can we save money. So to identify a SIP scheme or an efficiency scheme, we call it SIP and um, cost improvement program. And um, like I say, you might call it different. So um, a good example is something that results in a reduction in actual spend compared to the previous year's actual spend after taking account of any reduced income that might occur. So if you are purely making a saving um, that's a cost improvement. However, if it means that you are reducing income, you have to take that into account. So that's the best way to identify a cost improvement scheme. So and a good example of that is um, in 2019, uh, a drug was £10 and, and we used 100, so it cost us £1,000. But in 2020, the price went down to £7. We'll still use 100 of them and um, it doesn't make any difference, but it's only going to cost us £700. So that is a direct saving of £300 because the drug is exactly the same. We're using exactly the same amount and um, it's not costing us any money to change the drug. We're not losing any income. So it's just a pure, simple cost saving. And these are really kind of good things that you can kind of look out for. You can also look at it the other way. So something that results in an increase in the actual income compared to the previous year's actual income after you've thought about the fact that it might cost you more. So this is a good example of, for example, here, um, a clinic receiving a single professional tariff, but it was actually multi-professional. Um, it's always had two professionals, um, but we've just been coding it incorrectly. So we've actually, our costs haven't changed. They've said exactly the same, but we've increased our income. Um, these are currently known as code of conducts, um, but that's a simple cost saving initiative. So we're generating more income and it's not costing us any more. So you can also have, for example, um, you're putting on, you're putting one extra patient per session on. Um, the theatre session is exactly the same length with exactly the same number of professionals. Um, you've just managed to get the patients through a bit quicker due to a new piece of equipment, for example. Um, so that extra patient is income generation. Um, so that's a good example of that. Aren't, sit, aren't cost improvement. So um, surplus budget. So if you have more budget than you need, but you don't spend any less, that surplus budget isn't a cost improvement because you've not improved any costs. You've just not used the budget that's there. Um, negotiating a reduced cost for a product that wasn't purchased in the previous year. So you go out for your piece of equipment and they say it should cost £100,000, but we're going to give you a 10% discount and it's only going to cost you 90 grand. If you didn't purchase it the year before, it's not a cost saving, that's cost avoidance. So you can't say that that's a cost saving if initiative because um, you're not saving any money based on the previous year because you didn't purchase it in the previous year. So something that reduces your cost but shifts it to another business unit or another department. So say, for example, um, a department got charged for all your um, crockery and all your tableware. And actually, um, it's just going to be moved to another department because it's just been coded incorrectly. That's not an overall saving for the trust because it's just moving from one place to another. So that's not a cost saving initiative for you. You were charged for it incorrectly and it's just been moved to somewhere else in the trust so or the organisation. So um, it's not a saving money overall for the organisation. Then you've got um, managing a forecast run rate increase by implementing a scheme that recovers back to plan. So if your plan is to treat a thousand patients and you've fallen under plan, but then you um, do something like adding an extra patient on a, on a clinic session, and that means that you're now back up to plan, that's not an efficiency, that's not a cost saving because you're just getting back to where you should be. So you're not making any cost improvement. If you then go above plan, 
and it's not cost you any more to do that, then as with the previous example, that could be a cost improvement because it's not costing you any more. But just getting back to where you should be, that's not an efficiency scheme. So in the chat, I'm going to give some examples. If you want to let me know whether you think they are or aren't an efficiency scheme. So I have a vacant post in my budget, which I haven't filled for three years and no longer need so I can give up the funding. Do we think that is or isn't an efficiency scheme? Okie doke. Oh, we've got a mix coming in. Okie dokie. So this is not an efficiency scheme because there's no reduction in actual spend compared to the previous year because it was vacant then. So it was vacant last year and the year before that and the year before that. So based on the previous year, is spend there is no difference because it was vacant then so it's not an efficiency scheme if the post was filled in the previous year and say somebody retired and you say actually we've spread that work and we don't need the post anymore then that is an efficiency scheme because you had spend in the previous year but this one's been vacant for three years so it's not an efficiency scheme so a member of staff who has been with us many years is leaving and their replacement won't start for four months after the current post holder leaves. Therefore, there will be surplus budget for four months. Do we think this is or isn't an efficiency scheme? Okey doke. Again, we've got a mix. Okay, you know, quite a few are saying no, but this is an efficiency scheme um, because the actual spend will reduce for four months. So last year, Sumba, um, that person has been with us many years. So they were with us all the previous financial year. And this year, you're only going to pay for eight months because four months is going to be vacant. And um, so it is a cost saving initiative. It's non recurrent because it's not that person is, isn't only going to work eight months a year for every year following just in that one year you can give up the budget for four months and um, so that is a non-recurrent efficiency and um, because the previous spend has reduced by four months worth of salary so that is an efficiency scheme non-recurrent elective surgery is below the planned target due to a vacancy in the department however a new consultant has started and activity has now increased and is back up to plan do we think this is or isn't an efficiency scheme? Okie doke, the consensus at the minute is no. Not seeing any yeses. And you are correct. So it's just recovery to plan. So like we mentioned before, we've not gone above plan. All we've done is get back to where we should be. So we've not made any efficiencies and um, we've just got back to where we need to be. So that's not an efficiency scheme. The pediatric department have realised they've been charged for some drugs that re relate to dermatology and have asked finance to move the charges on a journal to dermatology, which has improved the pediatric position by 30K. Do we think this is or isn't an efficiency? Okay, doke. Again, the consensus is no, and you are correct. So it's just worse than the dermatology position. So this an efficiency has to improve the whole organisational financial position. So moving it from peds to dermatology is just moving the cost around. It's not saving any money. So you are correct. No saving. So as a budget holder, you've got responsibilities. So some of you might not be a budget holder. Some of you, you know, might just have an interest in finance and that's fine. But if you ever came into a role where you were a budget holder and um, there are a few different responsibilities. So where do you find them? 
So every organisation has standing financial instructions and a schema delegation. So it should be available on your trust website. If it's not, you can ask finance for it. Um, and that's where you find what you're responsible for as a budget holder. Some of the key SFIs, now these are quite specific to my organisation. They may be slightly different for your organisation. Like I say, you can speak to finance or look on your website to have a look. Um, but in my organisation, overspends need consent of the finance director or, or CFO uh, via management escalation. So technically, when our budget holders become budget holders, they sign up to say they will not overspend without our finance director's approval must not exceed the budgeted allowance, so must not go over budget, cannot appoint staff above the funded whole times without approval from the appropriate level. So for us, that is the Director of Workforce and Education. So um, if you want to overestablish your department for whatever reason, um, our Director of Workforce has to approve that. And the budget must be used for the purpose authorised at budget setting. So if you've got a hundred pounds spare in stationery, you can't use that to go and buy drugs because it's not the money is not set aside to pay for drugs. It's set aside to pay for stationery. Um, so you must use the budget for whatever it's given for um, and not for anything else. The schema delegation um, involves um, kind of how you go about procuring goods and your approval limit. So um, in our organisation, we have to involve procurement to ensure that we comply with Kendal legislation. So um, make sure, making sure the organisation gets the best price for goods or services. So as part of the schema delegation, you know, we say do not go and sign contracts and um, you need to go through procurement to, making sure, to make sure we're getting the best price. You've got to keep within your budget. A lot of them overlap and um, ensure appropriate authorisation to recruit above establishment and only approve financial transactions up to your approved limit. So, you, you know, a lot of um, a lot of organisations have ledger systems that, that manage this for them. So we use Oracle and you are given an approval limit in Oracle and you physically cannot approve transactions that are above your authorisation limit. But not every organisation has that. So it's within the um, scheme of delegation to make sure that, you know, if you're physically signing off an invoice, it's within your limits and not anything above. You've got other responsibilities, so you need to check your budget statements monthly. You need to inform the finance team as soon as possible if you've got any material unplanned spend. So like I say, if a piece of your equipment is just broken and you need to replace it, let finance know, let us know we're expecting it. Nine times out of 10, if that happens mid month, the invoice won't come onto the ledger until probably three or four weeks afterwards. So it's good that finance know because again, we can put that accrual in to account for the spend now because that's when it's happened um, rather than when the invoice comes in, which which might be quite a while down the line. You know, if, if there's a three month wait period for this piece of equipment, they, won't, they might not bill us until they provide it. So it's always good to just let finance know if you've got any material things that you need that you think we might need to know about. So investigate any costs that you don't recognise. So if you think, hmm, I've got somebody on my pay, uh, my pay charges that that person doesn't work on my ward or doesn't work in my department, query it. It might be that they're being coded to the wrong place and that actually somewhere, someone somewhere else is looking for them. And um, so raise those queries with finance, with payroll and um, check that the staff you're being charged for, check the banding's correct, check any overtime um, and that everything's in the correct place on the correct subjective codes. So really, really drill down into your budget as a budget holder. It's so important. And going back to the methods of budget setting, say, for example, your organisation uses historical budget setting. If you're being charged for things incorrectly or you're not being charged even worse, when you get your budget next year, you, you won't have the money for it. So it's really important to really drill down because it just increases the accuracy of your budget in the following year. And it's just constantly working on that. Also check that your non-pay charges are as you are expecting and that they're everything approved. So if you've got charges in there that actually you don't know what they're for or um, it's something that you've not approved, you know, query it, raise it. You know, it, even if you don't think it's something significant, it might be something that's happening every month. And if it is, you know, it's something we need to look at and find the right place for it. So definitely raise those with your finance team um, in our organisation, every division has has an allocated finance team. So people have got direct contacts and, um, so, you know, speak to your finance department, see if you have direct contacts and um, that you can go to and discuss the issues with. But does anybody have any questions on SFI, schema delegation or budget holder responsibilities 
or efficiency schemes. No, okie doke. So understanding your budget statement and SLR position. So these slides are focused on Oracle, which is what, which is the financial program that we use. However, the principles around it are exactly the same, no matter which financial um, program that you use. So our budget statements look like this, um, but kind of either way, you know, the elements are the same. So you've got pay, non-pay and income. You've got subjective codes, what those subjective codes mean. You've got your whole times. So the number of staff that you funded for and um, your contracted amount. So how many people you've got in post your worked, which is the um, whole time that have worked in the month and then you paid, which is the number of whole times that you have paid in the month. These may differ. So, for example, if you are over established, you might have more contracted than funded because you're over established. If, for example, you've got members of staff working overtime, then the worked and paid would be more than the contracted, because if they're only contracted for a whole time, you might be working more than a whole time. So it's always good to check those WTEs. Then you've got your annual budget, your next year plan. So most of these are kind of the same. Some of them account for what, any changes that might be put in place. Um, then you've got your in-month budget, your in-month spend and your in-month variance and the same year to date. Um, on this budget statement here, the forecast column isn't populated. Um, some organisations don't put their forecast into budget statements um, and it's just an internal finance use. Um, but you are more than welcome to discuss with your finance with your finance staff um, if you want to discuss your, your outturn, your forecast outturn and what finance think it's going to look like at the end of the year. So. Having a look at the individual elements, so this budget, the budget for this service says it's going to make a £1.4 million um, surplus. So before any of your indirect costs or your overheads, just pure spend and income, £1.4 million. Your year to date outturn, it actually made a £1.8 million surplus. So you can see on the income line that it actually overachieved its income by £519,000. So it, the year to date budget was £2.8 million, but it actually generated £3.3 .3 million. However, you can see on the lines above that they actually overspent on their pay and non-pay. However, overall, this surplus made a 306 grand surplus to budget. So you can see on the year to date budget was £1.4 million, but they actually made a surplus of £1.8 million. So then looking at your contracted again, you've got your funded, which is, approved, which is your approved establishment. You've got your contracted, which is your staff in post on your agreed contracted hours. You worked, which is your actual hours worked, including your overtime. And you paid, which is your actual hours worked, overtime and your enhancements. So those figures might often be very different. If you work in administration, for example, and um, those might be exactly the same. You might never do overtime, might never have enhancements, and you've just got one person in post who works whole time. So sometimes they'll be the same and sometimes they might vary. So down there it shows, for example, that if you've got one hour of overtime that's paid at double time, it's actually two worked hours. So that's how you can see why that figure might differ. So then you've got SLR, so this is produced by finance, which is service line reporting, which is measuring the profitability of each clinical specialty or department. So it looks at your income generated, looks at all the costs that, uh, that, have, that come from providing the service, and it reports it for each operational unit. It's got really good benefits, so it really helps finance and executive teams to look at where it needs service to where it needs service developments where it needs new investments and um, it helps with benchmarking um, and also we can really look at what's causing deficit so if you're an, an organization that's in deficit slr will be the first place to start to say this cost center is continuously overspending against budget so we really need to look at this service in more detail and what can we do to help this service come back in line with budget so it's got a really really good it's got really good benefits so here we can see how the budget statement we've just looked at, which showed that that service made a 1.8 million surplus. Actually, you can see how that now is going to change. 
So when we add SLR, which is direct costs, so these are your costs that are incurred by your patient but not included in your budget statement. So it's things like pathology tests, radiology, um, your theatre costs. You don't see them in your cost centre, but the things that are attributed to the patient. Then you add indirect costs. So these are things that um, are associated with patient care, but they can't be we can't directly attribute it to a patient. So if a patient goes into theatre or for a pathology test or for a scan, we know that that patient has had that treatment. However, things like medical records, catering, portering, those kind of things, we can't say that patient was pushed around the hospital and it took half an hour, so we've used X amount of a porter's time. It's not something we can attribute per patient, so we just spread it across. Then we've got overheads. So this is things like finance, payroll, IT. These are your back office functions. So they're not linked to patient activity, but they're essential to running a service. So you can't run your service without these things. And again, we spread them e evenly over the patients. And then you've got your capital charges. So things like your interest on your loans, dividends, depreciation, or your finance back office element things. They're also attributed equally. So if you can see here, this this cost centre generated £1.8 million, pound, but by the time we've added everything onto it, it's in a deficit of £765,000. So that's a crazy difference. And this, these things that happen here, direct costs, indirect costs, overheads, capital charges, you don't see them on your budget statement. So if I was if I was the budget holder of this cost centre and I saw that I, I was 306 grand in surplus and I generated £1.8 million pound worth of income, I'd be quite happy with myself. I'd think, well, I'm underspent. I've actually generated more income than I should have done. But by the time I've added on all my SLR elements, I'm 765 grand overspent. So SLR really shows that to a budget holder or to a service, that service seems profitable, but actually it's not. So SLR highlights that and that's how we can focus on how do we get these costs down in the background. So within your organisation, you'll have lots of tools available that can help you manage your budget. So you've got things like budget holder training, systems training, financial reporting, your finance teams. So the finance teams are the biggest tool to help you manage your budget. That's what we're here for. If you've got any queries or anything like that, just go to your finance department and say, look, I need help or how do I look at this or I want to do this and can you set me off with where to start? Um, and, you know, attending your budget holder training and going on your systems training. Also the financial reporting, um, which I know one somebody was talking to me about at the beginning um, around um, that it's not always presentable and we'll look at that in the spreadsheets element I can see a comment um the problem is budget holders can't control trust overheads etc exactly so when we do slr we that's how we see you know a service is costing a lot of money to run and that's how i think people like directors of finance and chief execs can look at where do we want to focus our attention how do we bring those costs down in the background Things like overheads aren't reflected in your budget statement. So if your budget statement is overspent, that's not because of overheads. That's because you pay is over your budget or your non pays over your budget. But SLR highlights the stuff in the background because we can't see it in your cost center. So when we when you meet with your finance staff and you look in your cost center and you're underspent, that's fine. If you're overspent, we look at how we're going to tackle that. But actually everything else in the background, we need to know how to look where to start with that, where to where it's costing more and how we kind of determine where we start. So that's what SLR does for us. So we know that budget holders can't control it, but we have to look at it some way. And that's how SLR highlights it. Any questions on SLR or managing budgets as a budget holder? Nope, okie doke. So the last section is just about using and interpreting spreadsheets. So um, I know that spreadsheets can seem very overwhelming, but there are a few, a few tools you can use in spreadsheets which can make data much more understandable. Now, I appreciate that some organisations will have standardised reporting. However, you are within your rights as a budget holder to raise to your finance department that actually it's not a way you can understand and your finance department can do one of two things about it. They can either sit down with you and individually and say right okay how can we make this more understandable and you can have some training or you never know they may put forward a suggestion to change the reporting recently within my organization well I say recently I was in a different post at the time so it must be 
maybe 12 or 18 months ago, our um, finance and performance committee said to our finance director that they couldn't, they didn't understand the reports they got in the committee meetings and that they wanted them changed. So we rewrote the board report, we rewrote the trust board report. And um, so always put forward, you know, if you don't think the reporting is is fit for purpose or it's not understandable, because you never know that it might actually be that every single budget holder across the organisation feels like that and just hasn't had time to say it. So definitely put that forward because you never know what changes you might be able to make. So spreadsheets are really flexible. So you can decide on the layout and you can decide on the content. So that's just a blank Excel. And there are so many things you can do with Excel to make your data more understandable. Things that you can do yourself as a budget holder. So if, for example, you didn't like the reporting that your finance team put forward and they've said, unfortunately, you're the only person, for example, that doesn't like it. And um, there's things you can do with the data to manipulate it, to make it more understandable. So we've got things like conditional formatting. So that's this section here. So it's really good for highlighting anomalies. So if you're looking for something that stands out as not being quite right, conditional formatting is a really great way to do it. It's a really good way to do RAG ratings. So for example, here you can see that we've just put some data into a table and this is showing in red anything that is higher than plus or minus 10 percent so the yearly average is 200 and the threshold is 10 percent this is highlighting any month where it's more or less than 10 percent so that's a good way just quickly rather you know this is just one year's worth of data but you might have four years worth of data you don't want to be looking at every single number trying to figure out whether it's all over 10 percent or more than less than 10 percent so conditional formatting picks that those numbers out straight away for you so that's a really good way to look at anomalies and to rag rate things and it's super quick and easy to do <clears throat> you've got things like graphs which are a great way of demonstrating trends and make sure when you do it that you understand the axes and what they're showing you so again, we've got the same set of data and we just want to look at it over a year. Looking at those numbers, 204 all the way down to 199, it's really hard to visually see that just by looking at numbers. The numbers don't look like they're very far apart, but as you can see, the peaks in month five and in month nine are really, really visible on this graph. So most of it looks pretty, pretty standard, but this shows you instantly that the number of patients peaked up in month five and dropped really low in month nine. So graphs are a really good way to demonstrate a trend. And, you know, sometimes people don't have that numerical brain and look like I say, looking at those numbers, even for somebody who's worked in NHS finance for seven years, looking at those numbers doesn't tell me anything. I, I don't I can't see from that that whichever number it is, 225 is a high number and 166 is a low number. But looking at that graph instantly, I can see where the problems are, where I need to look. So graphs are a really good thing you can do. And they're, again, super easy to pull together and your finance team can show you that. Pivot tables are another one. So these are a great way to drill down into, into each number to see the individual lines. So it can present mass data in a much more clear and concise way. And it's, it groups data for a simpler overview. So say, for example, there on the right, we've got a whole list of information. It's amounts paid to vendors or debt, sorry, outstanding debt for, for customers or amounts paid to vendors. So that is so overwhelming to look at. And you can see that the vendor numbers are repeated multiple times. That's, that's not easy to understand. That's not easy to calculate, but putting it in a pivot table groups those lines. So as you can see on the right hand side, we've got the first line's vendor three, the uh, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, ninth tenth lines are all vendor three you're not going to individually start adding all those up whereas putting it into a pivot table means that at the top there you've just got one line for vendor three with a sum of the total outstanding debt rather than each individual invoice so this was an age debt report what people owe us so that's a really really good way to drill down and group data and again it's so quick it's the quick click of three buttons and you know if you're receiving data in a way that's not understandable for you you can make the changes in excel and conditional formatting graphs and pivot tables are three really really key ones that i would say are always great to use so that's the end of the presentation does anybody have any questions i hope you found the session beneficial um, and I hope you've learned from it. And if you've got any questions, please go do and ask. Please do go and ask finance. I know we're all, we always say we're always busy, and, and I know clinicians are too. You know, especially at the minute. But 
if there's anything at all, going on your teams, you know, and, and showing that interest is, is great.